I'm, I'm Stephen Wooten. I'm the director of the food studies program. It's one of my favorite things to do on campus campus is to direct the food studies program for exactly the kind of reasons that uh, today's presentation are bringing up for us. All these kind of interconnections between people who might not necessarily find a common ground. You know, you work in, in your communities of scholarship or practice or whatever it is, and you kind of stay in those. But food has the capacity, I think, for really bringing people together. And the food studies program for me has been super enriching in terms of like meeting new people, hearing about new scholarship, hearing about new policy work or practice work or advocacy work that's going on. So being the director of the food studies program is kind of one of the things that I look at in terms of my portfolio of things to do is kind of like a labor of love. I like it a lot and I like being able to kind of connect people in this space and for these purposes. And today's presentation is, you know, really uh, uh, kind of a great example of this dynamic, talking about issues of, of health and, and insecurity around COVID, around farm workers, around practices, around contemporary uh, climate change issues and fire, all of these kind of things coming together. And I think that's when we're at our best as a community is when we can find something to rally around, not all the time, like to be together all the time from different kind of walks of life, but to come together every once in a while, like a meal, you know, like a possibility of coming together to share a meal. We usually do that. So I apologize to the newcomers to the food studies kind of food talks. We usually spend some time before each talk, having a meal together, sharing a meal together and getting to know each other a little bit. Kind of did a little bit of that as we've been leading up into the presentation today. But uh, next time in the future, when we come together for, for one, of, one of our food talks, we can eat together. Okay, I promise that we'll have a meal together before too long. Uh, Stephanie, I wanted to turn it over to you to talk a little bit about the, the Center for Environmental Futures, the co-sponsor of today's event. And in the process of passing it over to Stephanie, I wanna also thank Lisa for her work with food studies, helping uh, keep the ship uh, afloat, especially in these COVID times and working together remotely has been great. She's a, she's a terrific person, Lisa, and has helped a lot to get uh, food studies or keep food studies going, especially during this challenging time. So I'll turn the floor over to you, Stephanie, for a bit. I'd also like to thank Lisa, who mm -hmm. has been an incredible contributor to the Center for Environmental Futures as well. And some other folks that I see here, Sarah Wald, uh, mm -hmm. whose work has certainly brought us into the orbit of food studies before. But Stephen, thank you for all the work you do. Um, the Center for Environmental Futures wants to partner more with you. So um, we are a center that at the moment is co-directed by myself, Stephanie Lemonager, and Professor Marsha Weisiger, who couldn't be here today because she's actually doing some different center work. Uh, we have a very large steering committee of people from across the humanities and social sciences, and also the School of Design. Um, I want to congratulate Professor John Arroyo, who is here today, who was uh, just uh, just informed as we all were that he is going to become the director of the new Pacific Northwest Just Futures Institute for Racial and Climate Justice. Um, this actually is a result of a huge grant from the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation, which honors the work of John, of Laura Polito, of Mark Carey, of Alai Reyes Santos, and of many, many other people here at the university working on racial and climate justice. So. Um, we're, we're excited at the Center for Environmental Futures to be hosting that new institute with John again at the helm. So that's all I have to say, but I'm extremely excited for this event. I'm going to have to pop up a bit early because of a, an electrical crisis in my house. Mm -hmm. Terrific. And that's really great news. And, and in this time of, of difficult things, seeing something like that come together has been really phenomenal. And watching people's reactions to it is also heartening, right? And I think it's super important work. And it's super important that uh, all the actors brought that center together and super grateful for it. And it's super excited to see how it, how it unfolds and to see collaborations too that, that come from it. So let's turn our attention to the, the presentation today. So we have multiple uh, presenters and typically we, we get together over this hour from noon to one 
and uh, save time at the end of the presentations for questions and answers. And if that's all right with the presenters, we'll, we'll follow that kind of basic protocol. Uh, we have three presenters today, uh, Jennifer Martinez, from the director of the, the survey that we're gonna be talking about today and PSU from PSU, uh, Professor Lynn Steven from anthropology and class and many other things. And Rosie, Rosie Andalon, is Rosie here too? I haven't seen yet. Yeah, okay, all right, that's all right, I see, it's okay. Uh, so the two of you and then uh, Tim Herrera is uh, also gonna be with us, I think as well. So I think uh, uh, instead of like doing introductions for each person, I think in the in the process of your presentations, if you don't mind saying a little bit about who you are and your background, that way we can kind of connect you to the things that you're gonna be talking about. Okay. Okay. Great. And uh, and I think we have it set up so that uh, that you can share your screen when you want to. Okay. So I'll go ahead and kick it off, uh, Professor Stephen, if that's okay with you. Um, so I'm Jennifer Martinez, as, as you heard, I, um, I was the facilitator for this uh, amazing project that's still ongoing uh, right now. I am a doctoral candidate over at Portland State University at the Hatfield School of Government, hoping to finish up uh, my degree here. I did have to make a couple changes, um, and now I'm really uh, using some of this work uh, to finish off there. Um, I'm originally from uh, Central California, um, so I'm from a farm worker community. My parents are farm workers. All my family uh, members are farm workers. Uh, I'm from, you know, um, even when before we migrated uh, to the U.S. in Mexico, uh, my family also worked with the land. Um, so uh, that's sort of where my positioning is. Um, so. Unfortunately, um, our colleague uh, Rosie Andalon couldn't be here, so I'm just going to give you a brief uh, overview of our study results. And um, hopefully from there, um, then I could just say some quick remarks on how I'm situating the study. Uh, and then I'll, I'll shift the mic over to my colleague, Professor Steven. Again, I want to really thank Lisa uh, and Professor Wooten for uh, having us here today. Uh, and especially I want to thank the audience uh, for being here. I know that this week was nothing short of another important and significant week. And so because of those new cycles, it does get difficult, right? To you know, hang in there. So I really appreciate everyone that's here. Um, so just hopefully everyone can see my screen. If you can, um, I would definitely want to invite you to go out to our website, COVID19FarmWorkerStudy.org. Um, so you could see the work that, um, you know, the preliminary findings that we have out there, all, all of our reports, um, not only here in Oregon, but also in California and Washington. So um, as you've heard, this was a very uh, a very much collaborative collective research uh, we worked with 11 on the ground community based partners here in Oregon uh, along with Pacoon and a few other key organizations but this project is also much uh, part of a much broader or, um, project happening in California and Washington and this whole uh, study was really ignited by the California Institute of Rural Studies over in Northern California as soon as, you know, we started hearing that COVID-19 was impacting farm workers disproportionately. So uh, Professor Steven and I have been working very closely for the past nine months, despite not knowing each other before this. So, um, and as you could see here, um, our fiscal sponsors, Casa of Oregon, uh, we had a community foundations really support our work here, and we worked with several scholars around the state. Uh, but I'm just going to jam through these preliminary findings. Um, we have, uh, we are working on our final report for phase one. So how this study uh, worked out is that we did phase one, um, uh, we finished off in October where we collected 300 surveys from farm workers. Uh, and now we're moving on uh, off on to phase two and we're kicking off phase two pretty soon. Uh, and that phase is gonna be more qualitative uh, interviews. Uh, we're really trying to get a full picture of how farm workers continue to labor. We know that COVID-19 has very different stages. And so you could kind of see some of those temporal effects here in study. Um, and 
well, since we started with the study, you know, we really, we knew that we wanted to have some tools for action. And so uh, once we found our, once we, you know, had some preliminary data, we did have a press release and we presented these findings to a good audience. Uh, and with the help of Pacoon, we also were able to have uh, policy recommendations uh, that we unveiled to several state legislators here in Oregon. Um, so just really quickly, I'm showing you old data based on our preliminary results. And you could see the geographic location of our surveys across Oregon. Um, and just a quick note on representation. Uh, we did speak to farm workers on the farm, but also fresh packers, uh, those that work in the forestry industry and seafood. Uh, we did have a little overrepresentation of women, but that's often not heard. So we're not mad at that at all. Um, and we also are really proud that we were able to have uh, some rep uh, to at least 25% of our, our sample uh, were indigenous, our indigenous farm workers. So I'm just gonna ram through these 10 preliminary findings and then uh, switch over to some general remarks. Um, so one thing we found is that, you know, farm workers told us, they were reporting to us that when personal protective equipment, masks, things like that were available. They were taking all the steps necessary to uh, prevent, uh, to minimize their exposure, not only in the workplace, but also in the home. And so that meant they were washing their hands more. They reported that their coworkers were wearing their masks uh, about 77% of the time. Um, but there were also some important shifts that were happening. Farm workers were moving away from a collective uh, uh, carpooling transportation to the work site to more uh, uh, individual uh, driving to the work site. And so we know that has created unique vulnerabilities for some groups. Um, but farm workers were also telling us that while, you know, their employers were taking steps to prevent COVID-19 infection, uh, there were just because of the nature of, uh, of their job, there were moments where they were really close to uh, their coworkers without personal protection. Um, and so another important finding is that farm workers experienced significant loss of work and uh, of income right and most farm workers told us that they lost months and weeks of wages and we know that that has created uh, some ec some broad economic challenges and i'll talk about this here in a, in a second a little a little bit more into into detail um, but some of those challenges include food scarcity um, where you know farm workers told us that they were having a little bit harder time buying food uh, rent gas and electric and then and when we disaggregated our data based on um, indigeneity, those farm workers that identified as indigenous, we saw that um, these economic challenges were even more intensified uh, by that. Uh, and farm workers, uh, at the time that we were collecting our survey, so we finished off uh, up in October, uh, so that's before the second wave. But farm workers were already expressing to us that they already knew uh, their coworkers. 34% of farm workers told us that they already knew coworkers infected, and that 20% of their 20% um, uh, told us that they already have a member in the household that had become infected. So um, since then, there's been some studies from Purdue um, and uh, UC Berkeley that have sort of uh, confirmed our finding that you know farm workers are disproportionately impacted, and the rate of infection is much larger than we have actually. Counted. Captured. And, and this is related to the ability to quarantine. Uh, most farm workers uh, don't have told us that they don't have the means to isolate if someone actually did become uh, did become infected in their household. And so I just want to call your attention to a quote here that I uh, we translated and transcribed. Uh, one farm worker told us, uh, the truth is that I have no plans. I live in the living room with my daughter and there are two other families there. One in each room, there's nowhere to go. So that's sort of, um, you know, what, what farm workers are facing right now. Um, and related to this, uh, farm workers, uh, about half of them still did not know that they had access to sick leave from their employers. And they also didn't know about uh, re uh, relief funds organized by the state of Oregon or the federal government. And when we looked at indigenous farm workers, that lack of information was even more pronounced. Um, and so this relates a little to how we're getting information to farm workers, and I think Lynn, uh, Professor Stephen will speak a little more to that. Uh, but it's really important that we provide, you know, information to farm workers in the languages they speak. In uh, an effort that Professor Stephen and Oregon Law Center did, um, they found that just just uh, in in Oregon, uh, for, uh, folks speak 22 different languages just from Guatemala and Mexico. So I think she'll be speaking a little more on that. 
Um, and in addition to that, farm workers are having trouble uh, finding affordable childcare and supporting their children during the virtual schooling, right? And so about 79% of farm workers that we uh, interviewed have children under their care, but only 8% of them told us that they actually take their children to a yeah, child care center. Most rely on their extensive networks of either older children, family, and friends for, for care. And so, you know, farm workers are also feeling this intensity, right? Just like all of us feeling the collective trauma. Um, you know, their emotional well being has been impacted. Uh, but something here that's different, unlike us, is that they severely lack access to mental health care services. And so farm workers were already expressing to us that they had, you know, uh, they were fearful, they felt scared, depressed, and they were feeling these effects in the body, physical effects like migraines and tiredness. And then just to end here, just to give you a preview of our preliminary studies, um, farm workers are have deep ties to their homelands, right? And so many of them reported just being worried about their family uh, and the well-being of their family back home. Uh, most told us, about 40% of farm workers told us that they don't send remittances anymore uh, because of the economic challenges. Um, and, and many of them, you know, felt um, worried about that. Um, so that sort of ends just a, a quick primer on our preliminary findings. We do have some policy recommendations that I'm happy to talk about after uh, in the Q&A. But now I just kind of wanted to switch over to just some general remarks I wanted to make on how, um, as I've been reflecting, how to make sense of the survey, how to situate it. Um, so, and because I'm working on my dissertation, I figured that this is a good audience to kind of test some of this theory that I'm making uh, or, or connections that I'm making. Um, so, um, let me just kind of get this here. You could see my screen hopefully still. Okay, awesome. So, you know, it's really, I think it's really important, right, um, to situate uh, this study related to this long, this larger conversation about the global food system, right, not just here in Oregon, but overall globally. And, and we really need to connect this to the fires and extreme weather events we've been seeing here, but elsewhere, and really connect this also to immigration patterns that we've been observing, because these are all tethered to our food system. So when I was thinking about what should my message be, um, you know, I think at this point, it's already well documented that, you know, our food system, our enforcement agencies, our agricultural structures simply aren't, aren't built to protect farm workers, right? And we know that because there were exemptions in the National Labor Relations Law um, or Relations Act, Fair Labor Standards Act, right, that excluded farm domestic workers from minimum wage uh, protections, uh, uh, overtime pay, collective bargaining, right? And we know that that's because uh, these laws were passed in the late 30s and they were anti-Black, right? And so it's a vestige of enslavement. And, and so we know that. Um, and although right now we know that COVID-19 has pretty much affected all farms um, across the US, only 11 states currently have issued mandatory, mandatory farm worker safety rules, right? And so we're lucky we're in the state of Oregon uh, where we actually have COVID-19 emergency rules, likewise in Washington and California. Um, and so, you know, as these COVID-19 rules expire, it's really important that, you know, going back to business is just not possible anymore, right? So what I wanna propose to you today is that, you know, these disasters, these crises are really you know, as you all know, are bringing to light what remains hidden, hidden in everyday life. And so they're sort of stopping this autopilot that we've been on. And so, you know, I think what COVID is teaching us how to how to revolutionize these systems. Now, before you all laugh me out of the Zoom meeting, we know that institutions are not revolutionary, right? They're just not. But at least we could rethink these systems so that they have basic protections for farm workers, because we know that, you know, with the ongoing climate change, these things are only going to intensify. So my pitch to you is that in order to do that, in order to have create systems with basic protections, we really need to think of farm workers in their full lived multitudes, right, as full community members, not just in the workplace. And, um, you know, they don't just put food on our table, but they also have a life outside of the workplace. They're caretakers, they take care of their children, elders, 
but they're also sometimes folks that have been displaced with deep connections to their communities back home. They have political engagement desires, right? Um, so we need to bring visibility to their full well-being as full community members. Because even though we often hear of you know, the term migrants, um, and certainly some farm workers are migrants, uh, we definitely have H2A workers that we often don't see. This isn't a, a ghost workforce. And I think this is what our study showed is that the folks that spoke to us are mainly have are mainly a settled community. And so I think it's really important to think uh, intersectionally, right? Um, think cross-disciplinary uh, to, to really understand how we could protect farm workers and work together. And so I would argue that this study is really starting us on that first step to get this fuller picture of farm workers. Um, and so it's really giving us a window into the lives of the people that we spoke to, right? And um, in that sense, I feel like the study is sort of changing the narrative of when we think farm workers, uh, you know, when we say terms as resilient or vulnerable, like we really need to extend that uh, and extend that narrative to really bring these voices back to farm workers themselves. And so this is a picture of Sandra. She helped us collect uh, surveys. She's also um, a farm worker. And uh, this is a picture of her family that from a a newscast that happened at, at Univision. And uh, I think it's just really important to depict farm workers as full community, not just laboring somewhere in the fields, right, that we don't see. And so I think what's really important too is that without this community-based model that we used, you know, we really relied on uh, these organizations that work day in and day out with farm workers. Uh, but without them, we wouldn't have had the trust um, to really get a pulse of farm workers. And so when we're thinking of revamping policy, I think that is a fruitful model to follow, um, to, to go with those networks that already have trust. And so uh, hopefully I'm okay on time. Um, <laughs> so I just want to situate this with, um, you know, ongoing, you um, uh, environmental crisis, right, climate change. Uh, but something that I've been finding useful uh, to make sense of these results is a framework from Yarimar Bonilla and Marisol Lebron in The Aftershocks of Disaster. I don't know if you can see the book. Um, and so as I'm working on my dissertation, I really found this term aftershocks as important, right? Uh, because uh, they use a term to understand the unfolding events after Hurricane Maria um, to really describe the systemic failures following the hurricane in Puerto Rico. And just like ex extreme weather events, natural disasters, COVID-19 kind of follows that same pattern, even though we're not necessarily calling it, um, you know, uh, it, we're not, <laughs> putting it in the same light as a natural disaster. And so they define aftershocks as really these smaller effects that carry compounding damages and create these new urgencies. And so for example, when farm workers, you know, when we mentioned that farm workers lost weeks and months of wages, it's really important to, to understand the compounding effects of that, right? Um, and so, um, you know, some of the stories we heard from farm workers, it wasn't just them that lost their job, it was their many folks in their household, so maybe their spouse, maybe their older ch uh, children um, that also work, that contribute to the household lost their jobs, maybe the people that they live with, the roommate, also lost their jobs. So suddenly, um, you know, playing catch up with your monthly bills becomes a lot harder when that income impacts everybody. Um, and because the harvest is temporary, uh, you know, catch up is, is, does become harder and uh, many farm workers are undocumented so they're not eligible for unemployment. So uh, this creates a compounding effect, right? An aftershock in a way. And so we all saw pictures of farm workers working out in the fields during the wildfires. And so, you know, I stepped out a couple times during the wildfires for like five minutes or so and my lungs were on fire personally. Um, and we saw pictures of farm workers working out there without the proper masking, right? And so in a moment where they were already confronting COVID-19 and we know that this virus creates respiratory complications. Uh, even after we heard of farm workers, you know, being evacuated uh, and still showing up with their children to the fields the next day or losing their homes and still showing up to work. And so, and it's simply because they don't have the means to make ends meet, right? Because they already lost wages. And so the growers know that, right? Uh, we know that farm workers, uh, growers know that farm workers need the money. So um, many of them still let them, you know, work during that time. And I would say that this is an example of an aftershock as well. And um, we still don't know the long-term health effects of this event. We don't know the long-term health effects uh, or the effects of housing insecurity, right? And 
um, you know, it's because our agricultural policy framework is simply not built to protect farm workers. And so it's not that the, or, uh, the state of Oregon or farm worker advocates didn't mobilize to protect farm workers, but again, our structures aren't built to protect them. And so um, I just want to make sure that I don't divorce this conversation from ongoing climate change and the deforestation conversations that are going on that tie back to larger immigration patterns. And so what we witnessed this year with the global pandemic, forest fires, are really these climate shocks that we're seeing unfold with in increased frequency. There was a study published in the summer uh, from the University of Washington and Stanford University, and they projected that the number of days that are that it's just going to be too hot to work outside are going to double by 2050, and then 50 years after that, it's going to triple. So the mass, the PPE, um, the workflows that we're seeing, the specialization of the workplace is probably only going to intensify, and as you know, smaller farms try to deal in this new environment, we might see more consolidation of, uh, you know, of agricultural farmers, right? Um, and so it's really important to also note that communities farm workers live in uh, might also see, might also, those areas might also become more hazardous. So we really need to connect those two as well. And as this becomes the new normal, I think it's really important to, you know, to note that the treatment of farm workers is also the politics of climate change because uh, and and this is directly connected to immigration and displacement, right? Um, we know globalization is intertwined with climate change. Um, and here's a picture um, that we saw over the weekend of the Guala uh, Guatemalan uh, army or military holding off um, uh, um, some migrants coming in from Honduras, right? And so we know in Honduras and Central America, they haven't only been hit by COVID-19, but they've also been experiencing hurricanes, right? Um, in addition to their political context. So as this climate crisis intensifies, these vulnerabilities of income inequality are also gonna intensify. Structural disparities are gonna intensify displacement, we're going to see more displacement. Um, and this is all related um, to migrant scripts, right? Displacement is related to the migrant scripts, the way we talk about the narratives we talk about to describe uh, immigrants, right? Um, and so I think our survey was capturing some of that, that shifting population of farm workers um, from predominantly a Mexican war workforce, right, to we're seeing perhaps capturing more indigenous farm workers. And I think Professor Stephen could talk a little bit more about that. But, um, you know, I think perhaps the survey was already capturing that shift in, in population. Um, and what I wanted to note, too, is that sometimes these, uh, you know, xenophobia from climate, you know, from the climate climate crisis from uh, displacement doesn't always show up in Trump's border policies, right, or physical violence, but sometimes it's also economic and administrative violence. So, for example, farm workers that lost their homes in southern Oregon, many of them are excluded from FEMA, and so they weren't able to get any support for their homes, right, the homes that they lost. Um, we also, um, you know, could think of governor, uh, the governor over in Nebraska that's um, excluding, said he was going to exclude farm workers because they were undocumented, right? And so climate change adds to these migrant scripts and discourse surrounding migration. And this all affects how we can support uh, farm workers, mobilize to support farm workers, I I'd argue. Um, and then just my last slide here is, um, I think what we're also seeing is sort of like this disaster capitalism, and y'all are probably familiar with this term from Naomi Klein's book, The Shock Doctrine, that she defines as the tendency for governments to ramp through free market policies in the wake of major crisis. And so I just wanted to bring your attention really quick to the events that were happening in India, in India, right? Uh, uh, farm workers, farmers went out to the streets to manifest after uh, Modi's government wanted to implement some agricultural bills uh, to, you know, privatize some parts of uh, the agricultural system, right? So one of them was going to deregulate, one of the policies was going to deregulate crop pricing and uh, uh, that previously had floor pricing, there was going to be a shift, they're going to push farm work uh, farmers to use more resource intensive farming practices in a moment when there's a, there's already water scarcity in India. So, you know, I think we're seeing parts of disaster capitalism also play out in, in um, the response to COVID for farm workers in, in our food system. And when we think about how disaster capitalism is applied here in the US, I, I would argue that the way we're seeing that concept play out is with the banner uh, essential worker, right? We heard that that term come out um, 
as, as COVID was happening, right? Um, many farm workers received a, a letter from their employer uh, from that was written by the Department of Homeland Security saying that they were critical to the food supply chain so that they wouldn't be prioritized in deportations, right? So perhaps that's also an example of disaster capitalism, right? This is a, uh, a cake uh, we gave my dad because he retired as, as um, COVID was happening in April. And right when they were called back to harvest, uh, their employer uh, actually contracted them out. So they lost all type of medical insurance that they had at the moment. And so I thought it was very ironic, right, that many farm workers were given this name, essential worker. Um, you know, I told my dad, Mira, it is essential worker, even though you worked in the fields for like 40 years, you're finally essential worker, right? Farm workers have always been essential. And I think um, this banner has also been used, uh, this term has been used to only, um, you know, require that farm workers continue working unprotected, right? And we could also see other examples of that when Trump uh, issued his Defense Production Act, right, to classify meat processing plants as critical infrastructure and keep them open. Um, I have family that worked in Tyson um, at the time um, in Nebraska. And, you know, they told us if you've had COVID, if you've experienced COVID, you know that once you get it, it spreads like wildfire. And so, you know, they told me that they all of the family got infected, but because of the production act, they got called back to work two days later, um, not even enough time to quarantine, right? So we're seeing, I think, examples of disaster capitalism play out in the US as well. Of course, farm workers already don't have many safety nets, so it doesn't look the same as India. Um, and so I'm gonna end there, but I just do wanna say that I think a way to understand the survey is through these different stages, right? There are, we, as we've been navigating through COVID-19, each stage is a little different. And I think the survey gives as a good blueprint to really rethink these systems. Uh, and I think it's also really important to center community-based organizations, especially if we want these structures to protect farm workers. So that's it, thank you. That was fabulous. Really, really great presentation and super important uh, material that you covered really synthetically, really impressive. My head has lots of uh, questions going on in there and thoughts, but you presented us with some really, really important things to uh, ponder and think about. And, and uh, if folks are okay, we'll kind of go on with the next bits of the presentation and come back to, to questions. Okay, and I think, uh, uh, Lynn, are you gonna share your screen next or are you, or? Yep, there she is, thank you. Jenny, uh, thank you so much. That was incredible. And you can see why it's amazing to work with Jenny uh, in this project. Um, she, you know, great job of putting a really big frame on this. And um, I'm Lynn Steven, I'm a professor in anthropology uh, and uh, teaching Latinx studies and am affiliated with indigenous race, ethnic studies and women and gender studies. Um, and I, I've been working with folks who work in agriculture for a very long time. Uh, my mom uh, was uh, worked at a daycare center for children of farm workers outside of Chicago. And that was my first experience as a toddler. So farm workers have kind of been in my life uh, since then. Um, and I've uh, done a lot of work in Mexico and Guatemala and also with indigenous immigrants and farm workers here in Oregon. And I'm going to speak today just a little bit, uh, mostly blowing up some stories to put some more detail on some of the things that uh, Jennifer so elegantly laid out for us. And what I'm going to share is part of a larger paper um, about uh, indigenous Guatemalan farm workers who are fairly recent arrivals, say 2013 to the present. Um, and I, unlike everyone else, did not work with a, a community-based organization because recent Guatemalan immigrants are primarily hooked into churches, uh, schools, but in the process of, of working with um, someone I'll be talking about with the pseudonym, all the names I am using are pseudonyms, Juan, 
found out that there is a, a mutual aid association uh, in our state for uh, mom families. So I'll talk about that. But this work is based not only on the work I did in the survey, but also uh, research I've been doing uh, in Guatemala, in Huehuetenango, and also um, I serve as an expert witness on many asylum cases of indigenous folks from Mexico and Guatemala. I think I've done about 100 cases, and I often interview uh, those folks and work with them through time. So uh, in fact, the stories, and I called some of those folks for the survey, uh, and the, the stories I'm going to share today are of those folks that I have this longer term relationship with. And in fact, I know there are some of their extended families in Guatemala as well that, as them here. Um, so I'll just start. Um, boy, the bigger picture was really laid out by Jennifer. Um, I just wanted to put out a few things first. Um, we have roughly about 174,000 migrant and seasonal agricultural workers and family members in Oregon. Um, the only official statistic we can find is from 2014 that about 30%, 37% are undocumented, but we believe that to be much higher, probably at least 50%. Um, and I'm not gonna go over, Jennifer went over the fact that folks don't have access or knowledge about a lot of programs, some because they may not be eligible, but also just because of language. Um, this is the full list of all the languages spoken in Oregon. Um, so there's real diversity among Central American, Latin American, and Caribbean peoples in Oregon by ethnicity, race, different historical language and experiences. And this produces a lot of challenges, you know, in work, in school, in education, in legal services. But there are community-based organizations like the Oregon Law Center and others who we worked with. And I, were, I've, I actually co-taught a class with the Oregon Law Center with three of their Mishtek organizers about 10 years ago here at the University of Oregon. But they continue to develop a lot of great outreach models, navigation models. Um, and there also are really good shared models uh, that we've been connected with through this um, project. And just part of the significant bigger picture here that I think um, is important to include that Jenny touched on at the end is our foreign policy, uh, our immigration policy, and obviously our climate policy. And uh, the folks I've been working with and uh, whose stories I will briefly tell you um, are all seeking political asylum. Um, there are about 3,900 backlogged asylum cases in the state of Oregon, just from Guatemala, attached to many more people. Um, and the biographies, the stories of these folks who, who I've worked with as an expert witness, uh, it goes back to the 80s with US intervention in Central America, supporting armies and authoritarian governments, development aid that never gets where it's supposed to do and is based on a bad model, uh, climate change, uh, where people are no longer able to harvest their corn because of a dry corridor that runs through Guatemala, Honduras, El Salvador, uh, into Mexico. So all of this um, works together to drive people here. And I think we really need to reconceive how we think about movement and migration and even asylum, because it's not just one cause. Um, so um, one of the things I wanted to point out uh, is that um, a majority of the folks who come here, they've been agricultural workers their whole lives since their children. Um, and that also means they bring a lot of knowledge with them as well. Um, so many have worked uh, as laborers in coffee or other export crops, potatoes, broccoli, Brussels sprouts. Um, and for example, I'm going to talk about uh, a few people, but uh, Juana and her brother Jose, Jose grew up in a small hamlet several hours outside of San Sebastián, Huevetenango, and they harvested coffee and corn. And they started doing this on a plantation when they were 10 and 12 years old. They lived there and uh, um, Juana cooked for her brother Jose. Um, she's someone that I continue to talk to and be in touch with. Um, and they also worked harvesting corn at, at home. Um, and Jose now lives in Woodburn. 
Um, and he harvests now berries, hazelnuts, and other crops in Oregon. Um, and they have two children who stay with the neighbor, for example, when they, they were harvesting uh, blueberries in the summer and hazelnuts this fall. Um, Jose arrived here in 2013 from his community. Um, he was here for several years and then he paid for his wife Maria and his youngest daughter to be brought back to the US after they received death threats and other uh, circumstances that uh, involved them leaving. Um, they were granted asylum in 2016 and I was an expert witness uh, for, for their case. Other mom families, uh, those that are undocumented, are harvesting a variety of products in Oregon forests, including salal, pine cones, and wild mushrooms. Magdalena, who's another uh, person whose story I'm going to share a little bit, uh, was born in the middle of Guatemala's civil war. Uh, she was very young. Her father was shot to death in front of her. Um, she and her mother took refuge with some relatives, and she began working in a cornfield and a potato field when she was about five or six years old. Um, so she also uh, grew up as an agricultural worker in Guatemala. When she was 16, she met her future husband um, and they came to the US uh, with five of their children. They live on the coast and they have a pending asylum application. Uh, but in this one family, they work in seafood processing, berry harvesting, salal, pine cones, and mushrooms. Um, the oldest kids are out of high school and working full time. There are some kids uh, in school. So I'm just going to give a little bit more detail about these um, families. Uh, another family I've worked with is Rodolfo, who grew up in a mom speaking hamlet high up in Guatemala. He married Teresa at age 20, and they have two. Uh, several sons. Uh, Rodolfo never owned land. He worked as an agricultural laborer uh, in other people's fields, working in corn, broccoli, cauliflower, and potatoes. His wife earned income through textiles. Uh, when local gang members threatened their sons, um, they came here in 2019 as part of a very large wave of Guatemalans, some of whom are still parked on the US-Mexico border uh, through the practice of metering and weight in Mexico. I think they have some relatives there. Um, they have relatives in Oregon. They came here. They declared themselves to be asylum seekers at the border. They were detained, put in detention. And if you're over 18, when you're in detention, you have an ankle bracelet put on you to monitor your movements. So they moved into a crowded house that had one family per room. They began to work in whatever they could, harvesting salal, mushrooms, um, and one of the conditions of their release was they had to report to ICE. Uh, when they reported to ICE, um, when Rodolfo's wife reported to ICE with her two oldest sons, they accused her of tampering with her ankle bracelet. She was detained and deported. And now he is here with one son. Um, Josefina grew up also outside of Huehuetenango. She speaks mom in Spanish. She attended elementary school. She became a single mother at 21. Um, she received, uh, ex she was extorted and then received death threats and fled and she had to pay $10,000 to come to Oregon. Um, and that comes back later in the story because she didn't come very long ago and she still owns, owes that money. Um, she needed to send regular payments to pay off her coyote. Um, Okay, so let's talk just briefly about the conditions for indigenous farm workers in Oregon. Um, as I mentioned, a lot of indigenous workers, particularly mom workers, uh, for harvest salal, which is a sort of decorative floral plant. And actually uh, native peoples in Oregon today and before harvested the salal berries. Um, so it's very, it's in the forest, it's very hard work, you're paid by the bunch, and often people work in family groups, uh, and you can maybe make 87 to $100 a day working like a 10 or 12 hour day. Um, people also harvest pine cones. Uh, Mario and Magdalena, when I interviewed them, and I've talked to them since and before that, they were harvesting pine cones out in the woods, they're paid five bucks a bag. Um, they were living in a Walmart tent 
um, and, and had their own food. And these are like the, you know, the cinnamon pine cones that appear on your, on your Christmas wreath. Um, and a lot of people when they're working in agriculture, uh, you know, they're working on a piece rate. They're supposed to be paid uh, minimum wage, but there's a lot of documentation of wage theft um, that Pekun and, and other organizations um, have done. So I want to just blow up a little bit um, some of the, you know, really harsh impacts. Uh, this is a slide you saw before, um, but, you know, the, the, the combined multiple vulnerabilities that people experience by loss of income, inability to send remittances home, having your children at home with little or no uh, income, and uh, paying for food and rent. It's kind of a cascading uh, event. And, and, you know, all of these families lost, these four families I'm telling you about, they lost work for at least two months, no income. And of course, for some of them, they were coming off of a work season in December, January, February, where there's very little work too. So it, it intensified that loss uh, and people borrowed money. Um, they did, you know, they did the, the best that they could. But all of these families are also connected um, to their communities of origin. They call, they WhatsApp, they FaceTime. <laughs> they are very connected, you know, on a daily basis and they are supporting their parents, uh, sometimes siblings, uh, other people. Um, and they knew, for example, that their elderly parents depend on what, you know, what they send so that they can eat. And at the same time, um, COVID is happening in, in Guatemala in their home communities. And I spoke, I actually spoke with Juan's sister, you know, I spoke with other people on the other end and they're, the markets were closed. There's no transportation. Uh, Juan was terrified that um, his elderly parents who live like hours walk just to get somewhere would leave because they wouldn't have money for food. And he was sending them money for food, but he's worried about them getting COVID if they leave to go make some money uh, to feed themselves. Um, so, you know, we, we uh, talked about uh, you know, remittances and uh, people uh, not being able to send. So you just imagine the, the psychological weight um, of not being able to do that. Uh, Juan said he was worried about, you know, his parents. He said, I'm really worried about my parents' health. They're old and they're sick. I don't want them to need anything. I was sending them money so they could come home. I didn't want them to try to leave and earn money. I was really worried about COVID. And his sister is a nurse and reported to him she got COVID, the extended family got it, and of course they were, you know, worried about the parents. Rodolfo, uh, whose wife and sons were reported, was really worried. He said, I'm so worried about maintaining my family in Guatemala. My wife and my sons, they're deported. They have no money. Uh, there's no transport there. It's so bad that I have to borrow money even though I'm working to support them, to send to them. Um, so this, you know, just produced tremendous stress in people, um, as, uh, as Jennifer talked about. So not only is this about seeing farm workers as whole people with these big connections, right? Trans-territorial, you know, if we want to question in the framework of indigenous studies, you know, the establishment of the U.S. border, but you know, people in multiple contexts who are connected. This is actually a picture of a bank line in Todos Santos, Cuchumatan, Huehuetenango, where, you know, a couple of these families are from. So people are, you know, they're waiting there to like cash remittances checks. And probably there's no line now uh, because people don't, you know, they don't have checks. So, and we have to look at the integration of the mind, the body, and the spirit, right? Because all of this comes together in, you know, individual bodies connected to other bodies who are trying to think about care. So, um, you know, this distressing finding in terms of the kind of stress that people feel um, and lack of access to mental health services. Um, but I did want to, you know, sort of finish up by saying I've been incredibly inspired also by the forms of care and connection 
not only in these families, but among other folks. I mean, uh, on the, you know, when I was doing these surveys and also talking to other people, I said, what do you do? And people are there praying, they're walking, they're singing, they're playing music, they're hiking, they're watching TV, they're using uh, limpias and other traditional uh, cures. And, um, and then Juan tells me, you know, it was actually just a, a couple, maybe three weeks ago, um, he said, oh yeah, we have this um, Asociación de Ayuda Mutua, this mutual aid association. And we have, yeah, we have about a hundred families. We help this woman pay for her hospital stay. We're helping people with small loans. And, you know, we're not official. We, we want some support. You know, we need, you know, we need to get them hooked up with an institution. And there's, I think, been a conversation with Pekun that started to happen. Um, but this is, you know, this is the people who are like Juan and Magdalena that I'm describing to you and they're helping each other. Um, and if that's not inspirational, uh, I, don't, I don't know what is. Um, so I'll just end by saying a significant percentage of farm workers, not only in the US, but around the world uh, and particularly in, in Las Americas where we are, um, they come from millennial generations of ancestors who were the first to domesticate basic parts of our diet, like corn. Many come to the U.S. with this deep knowledge. They know a lot about producing food and health and food. Um, so indigenous farm workers bring many contributions to our state that benefit us all. And uh, just as Jenny uh, so elegantly said, it's time that our state and our federal labor, health, <laughs> immigration, uh, climate policies acknowledge not only their presence and challenges, but what they offer and the knowledge they might be able to bring to the table on climate, having, you know, made this really difficult journey for many of them, uh, these things I mentioned at the beginning, that's been normalized in their life for a really, you know, for a long time. Um, so deeply networked both here and back in their home communities, indigenous transterritorial farm workers can offer us all deep lessons in how to construct caring and connection across many borders. So I'll stop there, thanks. Fabulous, really, really great pairing of those two presentations from the kind of macro to the micro and individual stories to the kind of broader disaster capitalism stuff. Uh, Lynn, did you mention that that Tim is here? Was Tim going to say a few things or? I don't, I don't know. I didn't see him at the beginning. Okay, that's, a, that's okay. I just wanted to check before we went to kind of questions and comments to see if there was a, a piece there. But uh, if, he, if he's here and he pops in, that's fine. If you guys, if you're okay, we'll switch to some questions from, from the audience. We have a really big group. I think we were up to like 28 or 29 people. And I see uh, Michael's raising his hand. That's a great way to do it. And uh, go ahead and raise your hand and I'll watch it and Lisa will watch it and, and we'll try to identify who should uh, ask the question. Michael, I see your hand is up there. So I'll, uh, go ahead. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Jennifer and Lynn. Jennifer, that was amazing. I think I felt it. It's weird. Like we're not in the same I felt it like in the comments in the, I know people from their facial expressions. That was an incredible presentation. I mean, you captured so few people can capture something so specific and so human in its complexity, but immediately have the historical context. And what you focused on is change. And I don't want to say hope because I always say hope is, is it's not we have no choice but to struggle. So your research is situated in that necessity. And it's and it's this really deeply empirical and political. So I'm just really impressed. So I should introduce myself. I hear I'm just gushing. And so I, I teach at the law school, but I want to come with an invitation to you and your and the whole team, really everyone and everyone here today. The other role I have is I'm, I'm the United Nations Special Rapporteur on the Right to Food. What that means is the UN has made me the leading authority on, on food and agriculture hunger. I meet regularly with unions, with social movements, the Via Campesina, the food sovereignty movement, all over the world. And the fact that you situated these families struggle uh, internationally, I'm the opposite. I'm always in the international, but I'm in, I live in, this is my community. These are the people, these are my neighbors. Huh? 
So I want to invite you, my talk, Jennifer, Lisa, when did we, we scheduled it? I can't for the life of me remember. February 12th. February 12th. I would love to continue and think about how to take your work and if I can amplify it, if I can bring, because what I'm thinking is I want to bring political attention to the United States using my international uh, role. And there's ways we can talk about that later on. So it's just an open invitation. If, and if, Lynn, if you could send me anything to read, I would love to just really connect closely with what you're doing. And if we use the, my, my time next time as that space to think of collaboration. So I would love to use the, my talk to continue this conversation. That's just an invitation. We all have a, so much work. It's whenever people have the time and we're like, we're not going, we're all here. Like we're all gonna hang out, we're here. Whenever we're ready, I'd love to just see how I can offer what, I, what I'm seeing, bring that international solidarity to Oregon. Great. All in, absolutely. And especially when we're talking about, as Lynn laid out, um, all the connections, right, to families back home, I, I think that that's the perfect audience. So absolutely. Thank you so much. Other folks wanted to get involved and ask any questions and comments. And Lisa has put in the uh, chat the upcoming talks that that uh, that uh, first one that Michael mentioned, uh, the right to food, and and uh, really just a, a sidebar to say how important and and uh, you know influential Michael's position is, and and how grateful we are that he's in our community and food studies here. And being on that international scale at the UN kind of level is super, super important to be able to come together, like he said, in order to hear about the project that you're working on, Jennifer and Lynn, and put that in a wider conversation and, and see the connections from, from the macro to the micro, and especially through this, this Oregon scene that we're all kind of in. Uh, so the, the the talks are in the uh, chat, and we'll we'll share those. Other folks want to get involved with with the conversation. There's Gabriella. Okay. Yeah. Gabriella. Uh, uh, thank you, Jenny and and Lynn. This this is a really really great great study. Um, I have a question about public health issues. Um, how typically works the public health system in Oregon in relation to these, uh, not only the farm workers directly, but how are they connected with the farms itself? I understand that in, in rural Oregon, there are some uh, minor clinics or people from uh, Oregon public health tends to go to some of these uh, places. So I would like to learn more about that and whether or not they are being uh, talked about, you know, the future of vaccination for farm workers, which already began in California, I think yesterday or today. So I'm kind of wondering about that for Oregon because they are essential workers. That's the thing that it's going on in, in the Valley in California. So, and I guess the question is for both of you. I don't know who can answer that, but. Um, well, I don't know. I think Lynn might know a little more about this, but, um, you know, one thing, one of our, our partners, uh, we didn't have a partner that came from a clinic or the public health sector. And I think, um, unlike some of the other surveys that happened in Washington and California, I think that was really fruitful having a partner uh, that works at these clinics. But we did hear from farm workers that, you know, there are many clinics um, like in the Woodburn Clinic or Virginia Garcia that they're known um, by name to farm workers. So there is a lot of outreach. There's a lot of connection already there and relationships established. Um, I, I wouldn't. I wouldn't know. I know there. Um, there. I did just recently read an article that, although farm workers haven't been prioritized here in Oregon like they have been in California for the vaccine, uh, there are talks about them. You know, coming up pretty soon, um, and rolling that out to them and making uh, the the vaccine available to them. But um, I don't know. If, uh, 
Lynn, I would pass it on to you. <laughs> also, um, I mean, the or we did ha we did have a conversation with someone from the Oregon Health Authority, and they were sort of in the very beginning involved. Um, also, OSHA and BOLI, which are regulatory agencies for labor and labor conditions, are are also really important. Um, and people, you know, they have not been proactive. People in the survey, a couple of people talked about being afraid to make complaints because they would lose their job. You know, so these, they do like these inspections, but there's no proactive um, sort of work. So one of the things that Pecun is working on, and I know is, is to really push on these agencies to be proactive, to get out there because health, you know, the health of workers, it's also, it's all in the conditions. Um, and a lot of it's structural. And I agree with Jenny that, you know, tinkering with some of it, but the solution of putting, you know, plastic between meatpacking workers or FedEx or whoever it is, or, um, ha you know, people have to come together to gather fruit, put it in a bin. You know, there are structural things that just push work in certain directions. And I think the other big issue is just communication. One of the things when we talked about policy was really wanting different levels of, you know, for example, healthcare or health to be hooked up from the state, from counties to these local clinics. Because the, where the trust is exactly where Jenny said, it's your local clinic uh, where you go and you know they're not gonna ask you a lot of questions and they're gonna give you what you need and you might need to pay 10 or 15 or 20 bucks, but it will happen. Um, so I think there's, a, there, there's not necessarily connectivity between these different agencies and the, the state health agency, but you know, there's beginning to be work, you know, the language work is super important, you know, producing PSAs uh in all these languages and work around uh vaccinations and what they are and what they aren't and you know how to connect so i think there's there's a there's huge challenges in vaccinating anybody in oregon and reaching all of these folks who are represented in the survey is going to really require not just the kind of network that we have but also navigating folks but you know providing a person to connect people to where they can get vaccinated in a way that feels safe to them and follow up. And I, I don't know, Jenny, what you think, but I, I don't see a lot of that on the ground mm -hmm. laid out. Yeah, I, I don't quite yet. And um, I know right now all the attention is on vaccines, but um, what we learned at least through the study um, and our partners with like uh, uh, Farm Housing Development Corporation is that they did a lot of work to uh, test farm workers and even them actually going to farm workers homes and trying to test them there had some barriers right um, some some distrust and things like that so yeah I think um, that that COVID testing a model uh, can probably be also placed in this context of the vaccine but i think yeah as 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 professor steven mentioned that you know just like everyone there's still a lot of a little bit of pushback on vaccines and uh information right the information gaps and um and hopefully this model of this community-based center model can be uh connected and i think oha already does that um and hopefully I see. Thank you very much. I see Joanna. Is that uh, how you pronounce your name? Joanna, I see you there. And uh, I just before uh, moving to the question, I want to say before I know people have to go to different things at one. So just a quick thank you. Thank you very much. And we'll come back to that at the end again. But thank you before we lose more people to, to the things they're doing. Joanna. Uh, thank you. And uh, I'm thankful to the two the two speakers. It was very interesting, both both uh, of you. Uh, I think it's it's very it's very important the things that you are working on. Uh, I'm Joanna, uh, and yes, you 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 you, you said my name in the in the right way. Um, I'm uh, I'm based at the Center of Social Studies in the University of Coimbra in Portugal. Uh, I'm currently working in the, 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 the challenges of climate change in West Africa and uh, specifically to the uh, type of, of rice farming. Uh, and um, as I was listening to the first, the first speaker, 
uh, I was wondering how, how did you get in contact with the farm workers? Because uh, um, I imagine that um, they are in a vulnerable situation and um, uh, I don't know if they, if they are working for companies or for individual landowners. If uh, they, I, uh, they, are, they are probably informal workers very often. So how, how, how did you get in contact with them uh, in the first place? And how was that encounter of you and, and them? Thank you. Oh, I'll, I'll take a first out. Yeah, just the model, you know, which Jenny coordinated and engineered, which was incredible. Um, and, and, you know, I guess we both were involved in these conversations, but that the model is that you don't, you don't do a survey with a bunch of randomly chosen people we developed the questions in the survey with 11 different organizations and their staff. And they surveyed the people they already serve and know so that their outreach workers were the ones who were trained in doing the survey and they reached out and made, it was a phone survey because of the circumstances. So it's an extremely different research model from the get-go, from the, you know, the very questions that are asked, the questionnaire was developed with how many people, Jenny, like 14, 15? Yeah, at least. Yeah. So yeah. Maybe, maybe you can say more. Um, yeah, right. So uh, these, we, the farm workers we heard from, for the most part, uh, are connected to these community-based organizations. So the results are really telling us the best story, the best case scenario, right? Because these are the people, the folks connected already. Um, and for example, uh, Professor Steven did a, a few interviews, and so those were um, her own connections, right? So, uh, but yeah, we work through the community-based model, um, and and this is what I think extraordinary about our study. Uh, you know, tooting the horn again is um, that you know com our. Uh, the community-based leads, our contacts, or you know, our folks that worked with us, uh, were really leading the study. Right? They told us what they wanted to, you know, like what questions uh, are important to ask. Right? So um, they they were really the stewards of this and the information, and they're the ones that did the contact with the farm workers. Can I just add a little bit more? So, for example, we would have meetings with, I don't know, 12, 13 people. And we would go into little breakout rooms and the folks from the organizations would go through the questions or add them or critique them or change them. And now in the second phase, we're doing the same thing with uh, qualitative, you know, sort of more open ended questions. We just got all their suggestions and um, then it will really what happens next will also partially just depend on what they're interested in. What do they want to focus on? What are they going to bring to it? Um, so it's, it's also, I think, very much tied up in the identity of the organizations and some of them want to focus more on particular topics than other in the future. So it's a really different research model than what we're taught in grad school. Great, other, other questions or comments? I just quickly want to say that, um, you know, this model was thought up uh, by the folks over at CIRS, the California Institute for Rural Studies, and they've also been tapped by a couple other organizations um, to uh, uh, implement this model in some federal uh, data as well, because, you know, this model is really fruitful, it's important, um, and it really helps capture those voices of farm workers that often, you know, they, they're used to, um, you know, not being asked or, you know, being fearful if they are asked and if they say something wrong. So this community-based model really has helped with that. I put in the chat, I wondered if, if some of the discussion about the methodology and the model is in the report too, is that true? You know, not a little bit, but not in the kind of detail that we're talking about here. Okay, what was the organization that you mentioned, Jennifer? California Institute for Rural Studies and they, okay. California actually did publish a, a, a report on just the methods. So mm -hmm. uh, there's a little more there. Okay. So just check out our website, you'll find their report. Okay. Mm -hmm. Great. 
I know it's a little after one now. It's like a one ten. And uh, uh, if anybody has a final question or comment before I kind of wrap up, I would love to ask a question. If Go that's for okay. it, Lisa. Yeah, good. Um, if I'm remembering correctly, you were conducting the survey when the fires began mm -hmm. in Southern Oregon, and so I'm wondering. You know, I'm, I'm assuming you had talked to people before the fires began and then after they began. And I'm wondering how you saw the fires impacting um, people's struggles around COVID and vice versa. Yeah, we did end up adding a question about uh, wildfires, right? And, you know, housing and everything related to wildfires. But um, we are analyzing that data right now. So we don't quite know, you know, what the outcome was. Uh, but we do hope that we have at least a good handful of surveys that will talk a little bit about that and then we could see that trend right so temporal effects right these are the these are the stages of COVID and the wildfires that we hope the survey will capture especially as we're moving and implementing phase two we have a lot more questions on wildfires there yeah and one of the organizations UNITE mm -hmm. um, also uh, Kathy gave very moving testimony from their workers down there near Medford, uh, you know, in talents and talent in Phoenix. I don't know if you've seen it. My son uh, is going to school in Ashland and we drove through there with him. He almost got caught in those fires. Um, but, you know, I think it's 14 mobile home parks that were, you know, completely burned. Um, and even more disastrous than uh, up the Mackenzie, which I also recently saw and have a friend who lost a house there. But, you know, people were living in their cars, they were going to work. Something like 50% of the kids in elementary schools are homeless as a result of this. And just, you know, just add the wildfire onto everything else we, we found. And there's a lot of people, there's a lot of people living on the street. Um, in Medford and Ashland along, you know, uh, parks there, uh, Bear Creek, which goes between the two communities. So it's also really intensified uh, the experience of, you know, kids who are homeless, whole families. Um, yeah, so hmm. send your money to Unite. <laughs> yeah. And, and I think that uh, the, in the chat, there's also a, um, a place to donate, yeah. Uh -huh. Farm yeah, yeah. worker and immigrant fire relief fund. Um, you know, they don't, they're not a big organization, but they're doing great things. That's great. Uh, really inspiring, you know, inspiring was one of the words I think you used, Lynn, in, in one of your your comments about the individual stories, you know, distressing from, from a lot of angles, but also inspiring. And I think uh, you guys have produced in this short time, you know, a whole bunch of flags and lights on really big kind of structural issues and really personal kind of journeys, not just for the people that you're working with in the survey, but, you know, for you as well in the work that you're doing. And, and it's really profound and, and inspiring for, for me just hearing it and knowing that it's going on and really proud of the work that, that folks are doing represented in this presentation and all the, the people you're working with too. So I appreciate you doing the presentations, both of you, Jennifer and Lynn, and the work that you're doing to illuminate these issues and to personalize them, which I think really speaks to a bunch of different audiences. Some people are more affected by the personal stories. Some people are more affected by the disaster capitalism narrative and, and theory. And I love the way that it comes together in this, uh, in this work that you're doing. And thank you for doing it. And thank you for being part of this community and, and uh, sharing your expertise and your knowledge with us. And thank you to all the people who participated in the survey as well, all those people who gave their time and energy to help us understand that dynamic. Hope to see all, uh, some of you again, all of you again sometime. Everybody's welcome in the food studies community. Super grateful for the Center for Environmental Futures too. The things that are happening in terms of connections around these issues are, are really, really uh, gratifying. And I appreciate everybody uh, being part of the, 
uh, conversation today. And you know, we had a whole bunch of people that had to leave earlier too, but they were here and engaged, especially on a Friday in the midst of a lot of different stuff that's going on. So there's a lot of interest in the work that you're doing and a lot of interest in the, in the themes and issues that we're, we're concerned with. I wish everybody a really good, safe uh, weekend and, and future and, and hopefully get this vaccine working so that we can get back together in, in contact with each other. Great, thank you so much. Thanks everybody.